Hello! In the previous tutorial video, we learned how to use Final Cut Pro 10's color correction tools to adjust the exposure, dynamic range, and white balance of your entire image. In this video, we'll move beyond manipulating color to accurately reproduce what was shot, and begin using color creatively to draw attention to our subjects. Rather than apply changes to the entire image, we'll be using what are called masks. Masks allow us to choose specific parts of our image to apply color corrections to. Final Cut Pro 10 has two powerful masking tools that we'll be using to do this, the color mask and the shape mask. Shape masks allow us to select just a portion of our image to apply a correction to, using geometrical shapes like circles, ovals, and squares. A common use of a shape mask is to create a vignette, which for those of you who aren't familiar, is basically when an image is brighter in the middle, but gets darker as you get close to the edges. I'll show you what I mean. So watch this clip. The girl is the subject of this shot, so I wanted to try and make her pop more by using a vignette to bring her face out from the background. So I'll park my playhead in the timeline around here, since she's fully in frame. In the inspector, next to color, click on the rainbow colored plus icon. Under our primary color correction, or correction 1, we now have correction 2. There are two icons next to correction 2. Click on the icon with the circle. Shape mask 1 will show up under our correction, indicating that we'll be correcting with a shape mask. You'll see the shape mask in the viewer. Now listen carefully, because I'm going to explain what each part of the shape mask does. Dragging these four green dots around changes the size and the shape of our shape mask. Dragging this clear dot next to the four green dots changes the shape of our mask from a circle to a square. Dragging the center dot lets us move our shape mask around the image. Dragging this dot that's connected to the center dot lets us rotate the mask. Dragging this outer circle lets us control how much of our shape mask will fall off as we get further from the center of the mask. Essentially, inside the smaller circle, our correction is applied 100%. But in the area between the smaller circle and the bigger circle, the correction is applied less and less the further we go out. Outside of the bigger circle, no correction is applied. So again, these four green dots control the size and the shape of our mask. This dot changes the shape of our mask from a circle to a square. The center dot lets us move our mask around our image. The dot connected to the center dot lets us rotate our mask. The outer circle controls how much fall off our mask has. If this seems like a bit much, don't worry, you'll get really used to these controls the more that you use them. So, now that we know how masks work, let's center the mask on her face and we'll adjust the size, shape, and rotation so that the center of her face is inside the inner circle. We'll adjust the size of the outer circle because we want there to be some fall off from the center of her face to the edges, so that that way it'll look more natural. Also because we don't want our correction to go outside of her face and spill over against the background. So now, click on the right pointing arrow next to correction 2. We'll jump over here to the exposure tab, and we'll bring the highlight slider up. Now, you wouldn't bring it up this side, but I'm going to really exaggerate this so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to drag the highlight slider all the way up, and you're going to see that I'm bringing up the highlights, but only in the center of her face. The rest of the image is unaffected. With that vignette, she really pops off the background now. Unfortunately, watch what happens when I play the clip back. The correction is just kind of floating there, and when it's not over her face, it looks really awkward. What we need is we need the mask to follow her around the frame. And we do this using what are called keyframes. Keyframes, which allow you to automate the changing of a parameter, like the position of a shape mask, could be a video tutorial all of their own. But for the purposes of this tutorial, here's what you need to know. If we position our shape mask at the beginning of our clip and set a keyframe, and then jump to the end of our clip, move the shape mask, and set another keyframe, the shape mask will move from the first position to the other position smoothly in between the keyframes. It's probably easier to show you what I mean, actually. So let's take our playhead and go to the beginning of our clip. Click on this top left arrow to get back to the inspector. Now we'll position our shape mask over where her face is going to be. Now in the inspector, next to shape mask 1, hover near the right side, and you're going to see a little diamond shape. Click on it and it turns yellow. That yellow diamond is how Final Cut Pro 10 tells us that we've made a keyframe. Now let's take our playhead and jump to the end of the clip. 
reposition the shape mask, and now look in the inspector. You'll see that yellow diamond. Final Cut Pro 10 automatically created a new keyframe for us because once we create one keyframe, Final Cut Pro 10 will automatically make all of our new keyframes for us every time that we move the shape mask. So as we drag the playhead through the clip, you can see the shape mask smoothly move from one point to the other. It doesn't track her face perfectly, however, so we'll have to add some extra points to really smooth out the animation. We'll drag our playhead through, and when the mask isn't tracking right, we'll move it. Like here, I'll just jump ahead a few frames. It's not really tracking her well at this point, so I'm going to move the mask. You'll see that again in the inspector, this little yellow diamond means that Final Cut Pro 10 automatically added the keyframe for us. Let's keep going. Here's another spot where it's not quite tracking right, so we'll move the mask. Final Cut Pro 10 will add a keyframe for us. As you can imagine, the more keyframes that you add, the smoother it'll track. Okay, so let's give this a quick scrub through from beginning to end. I'm just going to drag the playhead through, and let's watch the mask. Alright, it looks like it's tracking her face pretty well right now. So let's actually do a playthrough, and we'll do some before and after with our color correction. And this little box next to correction 2, we'll click that to turn the correction on and off. So we'll click it to turn it off, and let's watch the clip without the correction applied. And this is the clip with the correction applied. Before, after. That extra brightness really brings out her face a lot. Okay, so there's one more thing I wanted to show you, and that's how to do a really dramatic vignette with really high contrast between our subject and our background. So, click on the right facing arrow next to Correction 2 again, and then open the Exposure tab. You see here at the bottom where it says Inside Mask and Outside Mask? And Inside Mask is currently highlighted. That means that the correction that we've applied is only applied to everything inside of the mask. But, what would happen if we chose outside mask? Then, any adjustments that we make will be applied to everything outside of the mask instead. Cool idea, right? So first, I'm going to click on outside mask. You'll see the controls reset, because this is actually a separate correction from the inside mask correction. So drag the global exposure slider down to really crush a lot of the background to black. See how much more dramatic that looks because of the extreme contrast? I'm going to click on Inside Mask to go back to the Inside Mask correction. And I'm going to bring those highlights down a bit so her face doesn't look so blown out, but it still has some pop. Then I'm going to go back to the Outside Mask correction because I think I've gone a little bit too dark. So I'm going to bring that up a little bit. That looks good. So now let's play the clip through and we'll do some before and after. Before. After, before, after. Good. In the previous Final Cut Pro 10 Color Correction Basics tutorial video, the adjustments that we made to exposure, dynamic range, and white balance were applied across our entire image. That's what's called a primary color correction, a correction that'll affect your entire image. Primary color correction should always be the first step in color correction, because it gets the majority of the image properly exposed and colored. But what if we wanted to apply a correction to only a specific color range? That is what is called a secondary color correction. We make a color mask based on a specific color or range of colors, and any adjustments we make will only affect that color or range of colors. Here's an example of a common use of a secondary color correction and that's continuity from one shot to another. This timeline is an excerpt from a multicam shoot, but unfortunately, the two cameras were set up differently, so the colors from the two cameras don't properly match up. I'll play a bit and pay extra attention to the girl's purple shirt to see what I mean. We can see that, in the A-cam shots, the girl's purple shirt isn't quite the same shade of purple, nor is it as saturated. But other than that, the shots look pretty close, so we really only want to work on the color of the shirt. So we'll make a color mask. In the inspector, next to color, click on the rainbow color plus icon. Under our primary color correction, or correction 1, we now have correction 2, where we'll make our secondary color correction. Next to correction 2, there are two icons. Click on the icon with the eyedropper. Color mask will show up under our correction, indicating that we'll be correcting with a color mask. 
Now listen closely because I'm going to explain all of the different controls you can use to make a color mask. First, we'll take our mouse pointer and we'll click and hold over the purple of the girl's shirt. You see everything goes black and white except for the color that we've selected. While still holding the mouse button, we'll start dragging the mouse out. You'll see a circle form which is showing us what color hues we are selecting to contribute to our color mask. The bigger we make the circle, the more colors are going into our mask. But as you can see, if we select too much color, then our mask starts containing colors that we didn't intend to select. Because of this, the more different your subject's color is from the rest of the frame, especially the parts of the frame immediately around it, the easier it will be to get a good mask. Okay, so we'll click and drag to select a rough mask. If we think we can do better, we just click and drag again to try again. We can add more to the mask by holding the shift key and click and dragging to add more color to our mask. But now we've accidentally added too much. We've added part of the brown door to our mask, and we've also added some skin tones because of the skin and the door are similar in color. So if we select too much, we can remove parts of our mask by holding down the option key, and then click and dragging like I'm doing over here to remove the door, and also these skin tones. That looks pretty good. It looks like we've done a decent job of isolating just the purple color of the shirt. We can refine this mask a bit more using this slider next to the words color mask, which controls the edge of our mask. Hold down the option key and click and drag this slider. We see that everything that isn't our mask is black, and as we drag this slider, it makes our mask slightly larger. This little option key trick is a good way to double check that you've pulled a good mask since it shows you exactly what's going to be affected. Now that we're happy with our mask, Click on the right pointing arrow next to Correction 2 to open the color board, and open the color tab. As I drag around this global puck here in the color board, you can see that only our mask is being affected, which is exactly what we want. So I'm going to take the global puck, move it over here, and move it up a bit to add additional purple. Now let's play it back, and we'll see that the girl's blouse color is matched from one shot to the next. Nice! Now, if we wanted to, we could even use the color board to completely replace the color of the girl's shirt. We could take the global slider here in the color board and just push it to a completely different color like this. Now, as you can see, it's not perfect. We'd need to spend a lot of time to pull a really, really good color mask if we're going to do color replacement like this. And also, if you push it too far, it's going to look really fake. But it can be done if you really want to put in the time to do it. Okay, now we're going to combine the techniques that we've learned to create an effect that's often called selective coloring. This was used to great effect in movies like Pleasantville and Sin City, and one of my recent favorites, the Rome episode of Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations on the Travel Channel. In this example, we're going to use masks to select just the green limes on this cutting board, and then we'll desaturate everything else. So basically, our frame will be all black and white, except for the green lime. The dramatic difference between the colored lime and the black and white surroundings will really draw the viewer's eye to the subject. Now, I really want to reiterate what I said earlier in the color mask portion of this tutorial. The more different your subject's color is from the rest of the frame, especially the parts of the frame immediately around it, the easier it will be to pull a good mask. This is a much bigger deal for selective coloring because of just how dramatic we're shifting the colors. Any imperfections in our mask will be very, very apparent against black and white. That's why I shot this scene with a green lime on the brown cutting board, to make it as easy as possible for me to pull a good mask. So in the inspector, next to color, click on the rainbow colored plus icon. We now have correction 2. Next to correction 2, click on the eyedropper icon so that we can pull a color mask. We'll use the eyedropper to pull our color mask. We'll grab some color from the inside of the lime using the eyedropper. Now, we'll hold the shift key, and we'll also add some green from the outside of the lime as well. Our mask is pretty good on the limes. So now, click on the right facing arrow next to correction 2, and open the saturation tab. At the bottom, click on outside mask, because our mask is on the limes, and we want to desaturate everything that is outside of that. So click on outside mask, and drag the global saturation puck all the way down. Pretty cool, right? However, in the top left corner over here, you can see something in the background that was also part of our color mask because it was the same shade of green as the limes. We can't remove it from the color mask because it's the same color. So what do we do? We combine our color mask with a shape mask. 
So click on the arrow in the top left corner to get back to the inspector. Now, next to Correction 2, click on the circle icon to get a shape mask. As you can see, as I drag the shape mask around, the color mask is still applied, but only within the shape mask. You can use a shape mask to limit the area in which a color mask gets applied, and that is very powerful. So now I'm going to take my shape mask, I'm going to make it square, I'm going to remove the vignette, and I'm going to resize and position it over the cutting board so that it only contains the limes. Now, that green blob in the background is no longer in our mask, it's desaturated too. To really emphasize this effect, you can go back to the color board, go to the exposure tab, click on outside mask, and add more contrast to the black and white areas by bringing down the shadows and bringing up the highlights. That little extra bit of contrast adds a lot of drama to the image. So now let's play it back. Our mask could definitely use a little bit more refinement, especially with the reflections on the knife, but still, you get the idea of what we're trying to achieve, and I like it.